Have you ever heard of the Merry-Go-Round? They're one of the best pop bands to come out of Los Angeles in the mid-60s. And by the end of this video, you're going to know the history of the band, the key players, and listen to some of their best tracks here on Pop Goes the 60s. We're in love. The Merry-Go-Round was formed in 1966 by Emmett Rhodes in Hawthorne, California. And Emmett was in a band prior to that called the Palace Guard. Also a band of teenagers led by the Baudouin brothers. Don Grady, later with My Three Sons, was also in that band for a short period of time. And uh, Emmett was the drummer. And uh, Emmett decided, uh, as he became a better songwriter, and he liked to sing, he was a good singer, and he started playing the guitar and he decided to form his own band with his high school buddy, Gary Cato. Now his high school, he went to the same high school as uh, the Beach Boys, as a matter of fact, and he was closer in age to Carl Wilson but uh, Emmett Rhodes tells stories of how Dennis Wilson broke his drum kit and that he was a lousy drummer. <laughs> As Emmett and Gary began rehearsals for their new band, they started working on harmonies, Emmett was writing songs, and they added a couple guys from high school in the band, and the demos that they created were taken to A&M Records, and A&M Records fell in love with them right away and signed them. Now, the original bass player and drummer got aced out by Joe Larson and Bill Reinhardt. Reinhardt was formerly of the Leaves, and Joe Larson was in an early incarnation of the Grassroots, and both of those guys had played a little bit with the Gene Clark band. So you, you got a couple of good professionals here, and they were ready to start recording as a solid band. Now, one of the main things that is said in historically about the Merry Go Round is their comparison to the Beatles, and particularly Emmett Rhodes' comparison to Paul McCartney. You know, I, I think this is just overblown, and I just get tired of hearing that. It really obscures the, the, the goodness of the Merry Go Round's music. Their output stands on its own. And by these very early tracks, when they were like 15, 16 years old, you're going to hear some really fine stuff. So the first song that they recorded, one of two, two first songs they did demos of, that song called Live was released as a single in Los Angeles by a &M Records. So Live charted at number one in Los Angeles. It was an immediate hit, and it charted nationally at number 63 on the Billboard Top 200. In Cashbox, it charted a little higher at 57. So a great star for this band. These kids were teenagers, and they started having to dealing with the, the adulation and the fame. So the next single they came out with also hit number one in Los Angeles. That's called You're a Very Lovely Woman. You're a very lovely woman, but I think I better turn you down this time. You're a Very Lovely Woman nationally didn't chart as well, it charted at number 90. But for having two number one songs in LA, A&M said, well, let's get an album out right away. So this is their first album. It's called Your Very Lovely Woman, Live. And I actually bought this album, still sealed, in the late 80s. I, it was a, um, a trade magazine I found. I don't even remember where it was from. This has it here. Les Harris Records, San Antonio, Texas. So Les, I've got your album. This was still sealed. I paid 30 bucks for it for a teenager. That was a hell of a lot of money. I opened it and I played it because I, I didn't really, I didn't know where I could get these songs ever again. But anyway, this album is a very solid album. It's a folk rock mix of, of songs. And you will hear a Beale influence, but you'll also hear a Bird influence. They didn't really use 12-string guitars, but they have a very jangly guitar. So let's listen to a couple of the tracks here. One of my all-time favorites is On Your Way Out. When your time is run out, your time is run out. So that's one of the more serious songs, but I mean, you can hear in a lot of these songs, Emmett Rhodes, his skill with melody, and you hear that on this song called We're In Love. Now, the most produced song on this album is a song called Time Will Show the Wiser. Backwards guitar was coming in vogue, and that was one of the studio tricks that bands like the Beatles did use. And they learned their guitar parts backwards and played them forwards and got this really great sound on Time Will Show the Wiser. Now that song was also covered by Fairport Convention, I believe on their debut album, 68. And this album is important, I think, in hindsight anyway, because they wrote all the material on this record. Emmett Rhodes, and there's a couple co-writes on here with Gary Cato, but very unusual for a teenage band to be able to write every song. 
So with two regional hit singles and an album to promote, they went on uh, on tour. They toured with uh, all the, the bands of the day, Electric Prunes, The Doors, Jefferson Airplane, Buffalo Springfield, and uh, they played the Magic Mountain Festival and some of the, the bigger pop festivals, actually. The Fantasy Fair and Magic Mountain Music Festival they played on both days, closing, I think, the second show. So they were getting a, some pretty good slots, and they were starting to get their chops together live. So with the album to promote, they were touring fairly heavily. They toured mostly California, but they did some tours of the East and the Midwest. And the album climbed to 180 in Billboard's Top 200, which isn't too bad. So as 1968 started, they continued to create singles. Now, these singles, this album was done rather hastily and they did very nice demos that were sweetened. They only had a couple of very well produced songs on this album. Overall, the sound is very good, but with their singles starting in 1968, there's more production put into them. Despite the very high quality of these new singles, they didn't chart. And during this time is when Bill Reinhardt left the band and was fired from the band. He was having problems and he was just kind of an upstart and they kicked him out of the band and brought in another guy called Rick Day. Rick Day was a seasoned musician. He had co-written the song uh, Just Like Me by Paul River and the Raiders and felt, got cheated out of all the money. So he was brought in to play bass and they continued on. They were starting to work on what was going to be the second album. And one of the centerpieces of that album was a song called Come Ride, which was a very, uh, probably their most psychedelic song and uh, very heavily produced. But she knows everything's right. So as they continued to record into late 68 and even early 1969, uh, this album never materialized. So many of these tracks uh, lingered in the vaults for a long time. And some of the, at this point, the band started to break apart because they just weren't having any success. They weren't touring as much since they didn't have any hits. They weren't getting bookings. And at this point, Emmett Rhodes, who was already well in command, started recording some things maybe without some of the other band members, songs like these two. Saturday night and I'm alone again It's been too long to Pardon me, is your love taken? Hope I haven't been mistaken Thinking you might love me So both Pardon Me and Saturday Night are, are great, great melodic pop songs and they didn't see the light of day until a couple years later uh, when another album came out to fill a contractual obligation. This was called American Dream and this was attributed just to Emmett Rhodes, but some of the merry-go-round songs are on this album. Now, the big split in the band came with Gary Cato and Emmett Rhodes, the two main founding members, and Emmett Rhodes wanted to stay with A&M Records. Gary Cato didn't think they were being taken care of and they weren't being promoted, and that was basically the split. So the band really petered out and didn't make much money. They were very young and they signed contracts in perpetuity, which basically gave their management all the future earnings, which was not good for them. So this was the beginning of a very rocky road for Emmett Rhodes, who had all the talent in the world, but just had some very poor management. Now, as he went into his solo career, so in 1970, he signed a deal where he had to come up with six albums in three years. That's an album every six months. And Rhodes was recording in his garage. He had built a very nice recording studio. So the way he was doing this at this point was he didn't form another band and he was recording all the instruments himself. And the contract he signed, there's really no way he could fulfill it. So as Emmett Rhodes began his solo career, he signed with ABC Dunhill. And at that point, he started recording his official first solo album. But what happened was, when that album came out, a m had assembled those latter-day merry-go-round songs and put out their own album under the name of Emmett Rhodes. So these two albums competed with one another and basically sunk. That album that a m put out is called Emmett Rhodes' American Dream. I don't have that one, but I have the, his actual first solo album by Dun on Dunhill called Emmett Rhodes. And this had a single, a hit single called Fresh as a Daisy. 
a minor hit, number 58, I believe it hit on Billboard. There was still promise for this guy. I mean, he was so young. He was only about 19 or 20 when he did this record, 21 maybe. And, um, but he had a contract to fulfill. So he did this record and then quickly followed up with Mirror. And if you listen to these records, they are very catchy, very, um, you know, power poppy, you know, early 70s pop. They're great songs. You couldn't deny the fact that he had a great voice, wrote some catchy tunes, and the instrumentation was all, always very good. So the third album, Farewell to Paradise, ended up being his last album for a while because he, he essentially just burned out. He could not produce the music that he signed up to produce. His management steered him into this deal and it was just not good to have to turn out that much material in that short of a period of time. So after he burned out after the third album, he ended up just working in the music business behind the scenes for a number of years and faded into obscurity. Now, one of the things that did come out, which I was extremely happy about, back in 1985, this album was released by Rhino Records, and I happened to buy this in the record store. I saw this, and I was always looking out for 60s bands, and reading the copious liner notes on the back, I realized that this is the type of music I would probably be interested in, and this is one of the best $8.96 investments I ever made. So if you can find this album, The Best of the Merry-Go-Round is a great starting point. There's very little to find of these guys on vinyl, but uh, it gives a wonderful history on the back and it has a good mix of album songs from the first album and the latter day singles. And uh, it, it actually talks about every song individually as well. So this is a great, great compilation. So in 2005, finally we get the definitive collection of the merry go -Round. This is called Listen, Listen. This is out of print already, so this is kind of pricey. But this has got the entire merry go -Round catalog. It includes some of his early solo stuff too, which may or may not have included some of the merry go -Round people. But there's also a hidden track on here, uh, California Girls. So they cover uh, the Beach Boys hit, California Girls, and that particular track was augmented by Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. So Herb Alpert was one of the big players at AM Records, and they had some involvement with the merry-go-round. So if you can find this, this is another great starting point, although it's getting pricier and pricier. So the story of the merry-go-round is rather, rather sad because you had a really talented guy who got eaten up by the record industry. Emmett Rhodes fell into some depression and had a real tough time to the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, uh, though he did rally in 2016 to record a brand new album, which is critically acclaimed. Passed away in summer of 2020, unfortunately, and all of a sudden we started to see these prices on these records go up. One other thing I'd like to mention is one of the, the other bands that covered the, the Merry Girl were the Bangles. This is their first album, and they did a cover of the song Live, and this was 1984, and this brought them a little bit of attention back though Emmett Rose didn't own any of the publishing he didn't make any money off of it unfortunately so there you have the story of the merry-go-round hope you enjoyed it check back next time for more great 60s bands on pop goes the 60s